uh, violations of, of neutral point of view, which is the, their term of art for objective editing, um, other things like that. And so we created a, a kind of a language or we got distilled a language that they were using and wound up with over 30 different types of violations. In this stage, we, and after doing this, we found out that there really was, there were almost no cases in which the arbitration committee ruled on the truth of a fact. In other words, they're not about content. So that hypothesis we got rid of pretty quickly as well, we've confirmed that. So we have these cases. So what we wanted to do, though, is think about how conduct relates to punishment. So we just this is just an overview of the remedies that could happen um, in, the, in these cases. And the reason they add up to more than 267 is because sometimes you have multiple parties. Sometimes you have the same party r receiving multiple remedies or ro multiple punishments. And as you can see, the most common punishment is caution or probation, right? Uh, which you might think is a relatively soft remedy. Um, and they, but you still have a decent number of total bans from Wikipedia um, and somewhat more bans from particular subjects. In other words, you're banned from writing about you know, George W. Bush or something, um, but you can participate oth otherwise on the, on the site. Um, or, or an article ban, right? Only, you know, so, so you could write about the Bush administration, but you can't write about you know, Dick Cheney or something like that, right? Um, but the, so we, we get this, this, the harshest punishment is the total ban, right? And so we want to think, how does this work? Well, what we did, we did a, a, a regression, um, and the regression table's in the paper. But one way to sort of express what the regression tells you is using a, a software package uh, and statistical package called Clarify, which says, OK, in a typical case, now knowing what we know about the regression data, what kind of probabilities do we see if we had the, the average case out of the 267 um, for these, these remedies? Well, it turns out, right, that, that again, 60, in, a, in the typical case, you've got a 63% probability of a caution or probation. The least likely, you've got a 15.7% um, case of Wikipedia ban. And when I say a typical case, this would be a case that has sort of the average amount of bad editing and the average amount of antisocial behavior, right? So it's a case that doesn't really exist. You've just you've created this average. Um, and the brackets show you the 95% confidence interval, which is why this is, this is prettier. Um, so as you can see, um, this just sort of reiterates this idea that cautions are more common. Well, the, the, the biggest finding, or the, I think our more, most important finding, is that if you looked at, this should, each of these should probably say only. So if, here's your probability of getting banned. If you only had an editing violation, if, in other words, if you only did bad, bad editing, your probability of getting banned is only 6.3%. This, we thought, was sort of in tension with the idea that the site is governed by these sort of objective editing norms. Um, that's not to say those aren't important. I think those norms are important. But the arbitration system is not necessarily about banning or punishing people who violate that norm. Um, instead, interestingly enough, right, you actually, you actually are much more likely to get banned if you have impersonation, that's like sock puppetry, or antisocial behavior, um, either like on, only by, by themselves or together, right? If you have those and you also have an editing violation, that would be the average case. Because in, that, in an average case, you have the average probability of antisocial behavior, the average probability of impersonation, and the average probability of, of having an editing violation. In the average case, you're actually less likely to get banned and we find that where you have impersonation and antisocial behavior and you also have an editing violation, you're actually less likely to get banned than if you have, these, you have impersonation and antisocial behavior by themselves. So our hypothesis, to, or our, our conclusion, or our theory, is to explain this um, by thinking about kind of weeding in and weeding out, right? That even though you're a bad editor, in other words, you're transgressing certain norms, Editing, bad editing shows a certain level of commitment, and they need editors, right? Um, so that they look for other remedies, you know, these cautionary remedies, mentorships, et cetera, for bad editing. And even, can, you know, bad editing can even help kind of excuse these other um, bad con examples of bad conduct, particularly impersonation, um, antisocial behavior, by showing that you have a commitment to the site. So what we conclude is that this, this system of dispute resolution is trying to attempt to make this conflict 
constitutive. It's actually trying to figure a way to channel it back in and weed in people who could be useful to the community and weed out people who are not useful, do not seem to show earmarks of being, hallmarks of being valuable to the community. Um, and so that's sort of interesting because of the, the notion of Wikipedia as a commons. Um, that's, I think, partially right that they're solving this prisoner's dilemma, but that's not the, the, I think, the whole function. There's also a coordination problem or a coordination game, if you like game theory, um, in that they're trying to find an equilibrium where they bring in people who m have matching levels of, of commitment and matching levels of commitment to these norms. Um, and so there's that as well. So that's, that represents the, the weeding out would be kicking out the people who would destroy the commons, right? The weeding in is figuring a way to keep the people who um, can be coordinated into working productively in the, on the project, even though they might you know, have moments of bad editing. So in a, a lot of ways, this starts to mirror some of the things you think about with criminal justice, things like rehabilitation, whether people are use, useful contributors in other ways apart from their transgressions. Um, we think the editing norm is still relevant. It's, it's just not, it's not the focus of the arbitration committee. Um, it seems to be honored in the breach, right? Um, and then finally, what, one thing one might wonder is, well, these are 267 cases over a year and a half. That's not a huge number given the number of people. Um, we were later told, once we had posted this, this paper, by the, we got a bunch of qualitative you know, sort of discussions that were pointed to by the actual by a bunch of ad administrators in Wikipedia, that this system is not as important today as it was two years ago during the period we were studying. And they said the reason is that a lot of the bi these cases actually became the subject of discussion and became sort of jumping off points for the creation of policies. So now you see some policies after this period that kind of enshrine what these, these uh, decisions were, were distilling. So in a way, there's this two-way direction uh, relationship between um, this system and the norms that they try to govern themselves by. Um, and, and so at, at the final um, sort of takeaway from this, I think as a lesson, is that this, this turns out to be um, both a kind of uh, a useful, uh, an optimistic um, sort of thing to look at and, and something that maybe is not replicable. Optimistic because I think it's important to remember that these people are, have created this system voluntarily and, they've, and it's fairly elaborate in some of the things it does and, uh, and in terms of its transparency and its record keeping. Um, however, the one thing that I have to keep coming back to when we think about this is they're so committed to this, this, um, this context and the situation of uh, di dialectic and discussion and conflict that they can commit to trying to manage it and make it constitutive. And I'm not, sh we, we're not sure, and again, this, is, this would be a, something to think about in the future, we're not sure how easily, easily that kind of commitment can be achieved elsewhere. So, I look forward to your comments. All right, there we go. Well, that was, a, that was a fascinating presentation. I couldn't help but sit here and refine some of my comments on the basis of that. And I'm sure that the other two panelists are going to react to mine as well. I think it's much more interesting to make this a conversation between the four panelists, and we have a lot of time to chew on that. I'm eager to get your input, too. I feel a little selfish coming in right now, because I'm sure lots of you have questions about the Wikipedia model. But it is interesting for me, I, I'm coming off five and a half years working in the eBay PayPal environment. And I feel like I've learned a lot. You know, I, I um, wrote a book about online dispute resolution before I got to eBay, and now every time I open that book, I cringe a little bit because I think I had done about a thousand disputes by the time I'd written that book, and now I, you know, have, have been exposed to many, many more systems. I wish I could go back and do an edition too. So I don't know, Ethan, if you have any pull with Jazzy Bass, maybe they can let me do another edition. But uh, a lot of the thinking that I feel uh, has that I've refined over the time that I've been at eBay, I've tried to put into this deck. And I think a lot of it gets to the points, I think, that was just raised, thinking about the Wikipedia example. So 
this is a broad topic, the emerging justice system, but I wanted to focus in particular on the notion of online community. Now, this is something, I, I, I spent a lot of time interacting at eBay and PayPal with MBAs. I don't know if we have that many MBAs, and I don't even know if they're called MBAs here in Israel, business-focused individuals, people who are focused on profit and loss. These are the kinds of people that shareholders like to put in charge of large corporations in the United States to maximize the return. Now, the challenge with MBAs is that they think about opportunities in a very particular way. And my background is actually not in from a business perspective. My background is in public policy. My practice area before I got into online dispute resolution was multi-party public disputes. So I'm actually what we call an MPP. And I focus mainly on looking on uh, public, public structures. So if you look at Wikipedia, which I think is a great first example, it's very difficult to, for an MBA to understand Wikipedia. What is the profit model for Wikipedia? I'm not sure if there is a profit model for Wikipedia. I think Jimmy Wales has tried very hard to find a profit model for Wikipedia, and he has not been able to figure one out. I think Linux is another good example. And there are plenty of examples out there. I know uh, I have many friends at Facebook. Facebook is trying very hard to find a profit model. And pretty much all they can come up with is advertising. However, the users understand the value proposition of Facebook. The users understand the value proposition of Linux and Wikipedia. So when you have an MBA mentality and you're trying to figure out all of these emerging online institutions, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around it. And I, the more time I spend at eBay, the more I feel the way to understand these online phenomena is not to think about them from the standpoint of Adam Smith. It's to think about them from the standpoint of John Locke. When I am doing, thinking about, am I going to be part of one of these websites? I'm saying, what's the value that accrues to me by participating within them? And once, and once I'm in there and I'm a member of this community, what right do I have to shape it? And if they violate their social contract with me, do I have the ability to leave? Now, uh, online citizenship, I've, I've said in many of these meetings in the past that uh, uh, if you counted up all of the users of eBay, we would be the fifth largest country in the world which is a nice tagline, but of course, most of those people don't feel any connection to eBay near the association that they feel with a national entity. I mean, I see all the national pride here in Israel. I don't see a lot of eBay flags flying around on people's houses, you know? That's just the way it goes. So, and the other thing is, people can be citizens of a thousand online countries. You know, I can be part of Facebook, and I can be part of MySpace, and I can be part of LinkedIn. They're, it's not exclusive. So it makes it very easy for me to say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of Facebook, I'm gone. Hang up, never log in again. And eBay has a lot of people that have done that. They've gotten so frustrated for one reason or another, or maybe their attention moved someplace else, they stopped logging in. But what we have found at eBay is this centrality of trust. Trust is, is the number one most important thing online uh, in terms of especially e-commerce. But I think if you look at some of these other models that are not commercial models, still trust becomes very important. Wikipedia is about trust. It's not just about that your money is going to get you your item. It's that the information that's there is trustworthy. And the reason why Wikipedia is putting so much energy into all of this is because they know that if they don't invest in the trustworthiness of their mechanism, it's all going to fall through their hands like sand. Uh, another very big thing that's happening in many of these communities is reputation. Reputation is a huge thing at eBay. People care about their reputation. What is your feedback? Did you get positive feedback? And if, there, if the institution that monitors or manages this community goes in and starts unilaterally descoring feedback or changing feedback, then the entire trust infrastructure of their, that reputation system falls apart. And then what you see is people start to leave because they don't trust it. So I've sp we spent a lot of time talking about dispute resolution. I'm from the dispute resolution field. But I feel like there's a bigger word that we all dance around in this field that we don't really talk about, but I'm starting to think a lot more about, which is justice. And we have a lot of law professors in the audience who know a lot more about justice than I do. But I feel like if I talk to customers at eBay, I talk about redress, 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 but what they're saying back to me is justice, justice, justice. We want fairness. So when we talk about institutions, I think that concept is very important. Now, online justice. Online dispute resolution is very transaction-based. I'm going to talk a minute about some, some lessons that we've learned in the face-to-face -face dispute resolution field. And we have giants here in the audience like Carrie has been thinking about this for a long, long time. So I'm not going to uh, presume that I, I'm the expert here, but I just want to name some things and then hopefully spark a conversation. Fundamentally, if you look at what's happening, and in, in Silicon Valley, maybe this is a little more apparent than it is. I mean, Israel is, is essentially close to Silicon Valley. Haifa is the... Uh, Silicon Valley of Israel, I was told yesterday. So our lives are moving online. There is no question that this is true. If you look at the younger generation, 
maybe if, I don't know, you think on an abstract percentage basis, how much of their lives exists in the electronic ether? For many of us, it's maybe 5%, 10%, 20%. I work at an high tech company. My wife makes fun of me. I work on a computer all day. I come home, the first thing I do is get on the computer. So maybe 50% of my life is online. We are seeing a huge change in what it means to be a person. Now, online dispute resolution, online redress, online justice is part of this institution building. As we shift our lives into this, this new sphere, as it's been referred to, we need to have these, these structures in place to help people work out their problems. I don't think that we in this field have thought adequately about what that means to be a so, an institution, part of this new institution that we're moving towards. We've been very transactional in our focus. E-commerce kind of makes, e-commerce appeals to the MBA in me because it does focus on transactions. But when you look at social networking, which really in many respects is, is supplanting e-commerce as the dominant application online, you start to see many more of these questions, these, these, these difficult to answer questions emerge. Who runs things? Where does power reside? Who owns what we're making here jointly, all of us together? Who owns this and what can they do with it? And how does law relate to all of this? I think e-commerce has been really the engine in ODR for a long time. And in some ways, it's overly simplified the questions that we should be asking ourselves. And if you look at where technology is heading, there are much harder questions there that we need to wrestle with. So I'm not going to presume to answer these things, but I'm going to ask them to all of us because I'd like them to think about them jointly. All right, let me speak briefly about some of the limits of the ADR field. And again, I'm speaking very much from a North American context. I understand there is a global alternative dispute resolution movement, and many countries are in very different phases of their development of ADR. But in the United States, I would presume to say that we've reached a bit of a crisis in terms of thinking, what is the ADR field, and where are we going? Some of the aspects of this crisis are, one, we are very focused on mediation. Mediation has become the focus of ADR. Now, ADR has been defined as everything that's not the court system. And if you think about that, that's huge. There are millions of possibilities. But we have, in the ADR field in the US, have focused down pretty much on one function, which is mediation. Well, there's a lot of discussion. Are we a field or are we a discipline? Can you be a professional dispute resolution person? We've tried to certify people to say, you are a certified mediator. And it's Im impossible. We've been doing it for decades. We can't figure out how to do that because we can't figure out what does it mean to be a mediator? What skills should you have? Much of the good work that's being done in the ADR field is being done by non-professionals. People that have never had a mediation training, they don't know what mediation even means. They think it means meditation. They hear resolution, they think New Year's. You know, that's the way. But they're great at dispute resolution. So what, what do you do with these people? And there are also people out there who've been doing dispute resolution for a very long time, and then you see what they're doing, and you, whoa, wait a minute. You know, I don't know if that's really great. So that's a hard thing to wrestle with. The other thing is the dispute resolution field has long, this has been talked about for decades, has operated in the shadow of the law. And I think we have flattered ourselves to think that we were kind of wrestling with this institution and helping to redefine it, which I think is true. We have to a certain degree. But increasingly, our field has been co-opted by the legal field. The Association for Conflict Resolution, which is the premier professional organization for dispute resolution professionals, has had a lot of struggles recently. However, the American Bar Association dispute resolution section is growing by leaps and bounds. And again, Kerry, I don't mean, you're, there are a lot of lawyers in, in the audience, I don't mean to alienate anyone, but um, the persistence of the legal model and the legal frame continues to be a huge challenge in the dispute resolution field. Now, why do I raise all of this? Because I, do, I think that ODR is very clearly an inheritor to the ADR field. And I think that we have inherited many of these cognitive frames and many of the same vulnerabilities that the ADR field is wrestling with. So several of you have seen my model for ADR before, so I'm just going to briefly put it up here, not dwell on it too much. But you can see the different building blocks of ODR are very similar to the different building blocks of ADR. You see negotiation, you see mediation, you see evaluation. Um, I think that in ODR we have a much stronger claim to the, f the, f the uh, initial stage of problem diagnosis, but I'm not going to get into that too much here. And a lot of us have talked in the dispute resolution field about the movement from non-binding facilitative processes to binding processes. Now what we often see in the ODR field is the use of many of these building blocks in conjunction to act like filters to resolve disputes as much upstream as possible. So what you can see is looking at this model we really are thinking from the same standpoint as the ADR field, the alternative dispute resolution field. We're just trying to bring that online. 
And I think that we've seen that there are some things that technology enables us to do in dispute resolution that is impractical, if not impossible, in the face-to-face -face world. And we've innovated within ODR to create these new tools. But we have not fully grasped the scope of possibility that technology provides ODR. And we have not, we have settled into certain frames for thinking about how ODR works that I think are hindering our ability to move forward. So how am I doing on time, Horna? You can take another few minutes. Okay, good, another few minutes. I can talk about this all day. Ethan, do you want to give me your session? I know you don't really have anything to say. Okay, good, good. Um, and I want, I want there to be time for conversation here, so I only have a couple more slides. But I think online dispute resolution as well, we have become overly focused on mediation and arbitration. That has become something, when we think about ODR, we are thinking about, well, how can we deliver these services more effectively through technology? And again, that was a problem in the ADR field. I think it's a problem we need to break out of in the ODR field. Because fundamentally, when you talk to our clients, they aren't just looking for mediation and arbitration. They're looking for many other things. The other thing is our focus on disputes. I remember in the early days of this field, we had a lot of time, we spent a lot of time talking about what should we call ourselves? And we decided to be ODR, I think partially because we did want to um, grow out of the core of ADR thought and research. We were very proud of the fact that we used the AAA um, spider standards as our standards in ODR because we didn't want to say we were creating this from whole cloth. But at the same time, disputes has been an albatross around the neck of the dispute resolution field. Because many of the things that people wrestle with, they do not, they resist definition as being disputes. Ethan and I were just attended a meeting in Washington, D.C. I really feel like the use of the word disputes was the, the primary hurdle to all these people understanding the value that our field had to bring. Because they did not want to define the issues that they were trying to get resolved as disputes. So to say, well, let's bring in the online dispute resolution field, they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know if these are disputes. So we're very focused on that language. Second of all, or third of all, we've come up with certain calcified models for ODR practice, one of which is blind bidding. Blind bidding was invented in 1999, and I think it's very exciting. I mean, I don't want to speak for CyberSettle, who I know is in the audience. They've done a lot in terms of innovating and pushing the model of blind bidding, but it has been around relatively unchanged for quite a long period of time. The same thing is true with third-party mediation and arbitration. Um, I ran an online dispute resolution startup in 1999. We have far more advanced implementations of that, including the online arbitration court we saw this morning, including Jurapax, including many of the companies in the audience. But fundamentally, it's still operating the same way. Look at technology. Look at what, how technology has evolved in the last five, six, seven years. I mean, there are things we could do now we couldn't even conceive of back in 99. Why is it that we are still trying to provide the same services that we came up with almost 10 years ago? The other thing is, I feel like in the dispute resolution field, we often tell people what they want. We say, look, you, I know that you say you want this, you want your Perry Mason day in court, but what you really want is this wonderful process that I understand and that I've come up with, and you may not understand, but I'll, exp I'll walk you through it. And I think that that is very short-sighted. I think that we oftentimes have customers say, well, you think that you know what I want better than I, I know what I want, and I disagree with that, so I'm going to go someplace else. We also see the people that go through our processes oftentimes show no greater likelihood to use them in the future, even though they've gone through them. That's not a good sign. If you have someone use your process, they should say, wow, that was great, and next time they need to be much more willing to use it. Finally, insensitivity to evolving needs and expectations of parties on the internet and an inability to deliver services at acceptable costs. We all want disputants to want to pay $100 per case. But the fact is, it doesn't look like this for e-commerce disputes. How, how about I say that? If it's an IP dispute for $500,000, maybe they'll pay a lot more than that. But our parties have shown incredible resistance to paying us the amount of money that we think we deserve for these services. And we've never really fully come to terms with that. So I, again, I only have a certain amount of time. I don't want to go into really bearing my soul here. I don't want to start weeping on the podium. I don't know if that's, you know, this is a UN meeting. We should all maintain our decorum. But uh, this has been a real struggle at eBay and PayPal. There is a fight for the soul of online dispute resolution within this company. And it's not been made public yet, but I think very soon it will be made public. There is a fight between the marketers and the dispute resolvers. There is a fight between the advocates of fairness and justice. That's me. I wish I had a big S on my chest or a big E or something. And the advocates of customer service. The advocates of the buyer is always right. Uh, there is a big move at eBay to say it doesn't matter if the buyer is right or wrong. It doesn't matter what the fair outcome is. 
The fact is, we need this buyer. And if they have a problem, we're going to take care of them. That is, I think, antithetical to a lot of the values that make up this field. So we need to think about what, what is the role of justice in that environment. And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that if we want to get into it. But I think it was this case study that really brought me to many of these realizations. So let me just wrap this up because I know we have two other panelists. I think we need to think about expanding the definition of ODR, reconceptualizing our field. Yes, we have a lot of innovations and value that we have hatched in this field that we have yet to communicate to the world. I don't mean to say we need to slow down our advocacy, but at the same time, we need to be much more customer focused. We need to be more client focused. That is the only way that we can figure out the path forward. Because fundamentally, and this is a lesson that eBay has learned that I agree with, it is the people who are going to pay for these services that need to have an opportunity to def define what these services are. Um, so I think that's true, in, and it needs to be by sector. We need to look at commercial arbitration, e-commerce, community management. Each of these sectors has very different needs. So we can't come up with one third-party solution and expect it to be a panacea in all contexts. We need to retool our language. We need to rethink this focus on disputes. Let's think about focusing on the positive, resolutions on issues. That's what people want is solutions. They don't want somebody to tell them, oh, well, you know, you're unable to resolve this yourself. Increasing flexibility, decreasing rigidity, technological advances. Our field should be moving at the pace of technological advance. We should be integrating some of these, these, these new technologies, and I don't see us doing it. Part of it's a resource constraint, but I think also part of it is us patting each other on the back about the way ODR works and not willing to put in the long nights necessary to ride that wave. Um, another thing I was speaking with my friend Chitu about this yesterday, we need to really focus on the needs of the developing world. I think we spend a lot of time thinking about the developed world, but the real opportunities and the real value of dispute resolution, much like Skype, a company that eBay owns, exist in places where these infrastructures don't exist. So we need to definitely, uh, um, and I know I'm looking at Jeff Oresti, who's been the, you know, great at pushing this, on pushing this particular part of the agenda. That needs to be a big part of our effort here, is focusing on those communities. And I also am looking at my friend Dan in the audience who works in the public context. I think that there are a lot of different issues associated with introducing online dispute resolution in public fora as opposed to private fora. So we need to be specific there too. So my belief is ODR is core to the creation of these new institutions. We need to start talking about justice. We need to think about changing our language so it's more client focused. We need to give our customers, the people that are not experts in this area, the ability to help define the field so that we aren't just going out there and trying to tell people what's good for them. And we need to ride the advances in technology. I personally believe, based on all the struggles that the alternative dispute resolution field is experiencing, I feel like ODR may be the future of the alternative dispute resolution field because we are young enough and we're nimble enough to make the changes that are necessary to matter moving ahead. And I'm not sure if that's necessarily true with the broader field. So as, as all of our lives move online, ODR becomes less of a niche service and becomes main, mainly, it, it becomes a mainstream service. So I think that we need to answer these questions in order to deliver on the overall promise of ADR. So that's it, thank you.
you're waiting as if I have so much to say, I'll just begin by saying that procedural rules for ODRs, one may expect that when people engage in building their own new substantial legal regimes, they would also attempt to set up their own uh, rules for settling disputes in a manner which is much more attentive to their own unique collaborative normative compass. Uh, so I made a very brief and very initial inquiry and my general observation is that overall the collaborative nature of cultural production and sharing norms is not reflected in dispute resolution between participants and here are just a few examples. Take for example the GNU GPA license or the Creative Commons license there is no reference to dispute resolution. All disputes between licensors and licensees, between those who provide content subordinated to the Creative Commons license or those who use content which is governed by the Creative Commons license, all those disputes are basically channeled to the general state judiciary system. And the question is whether this system is capable of being uh, attentive to the ideological background, to the values that underlie those collaborative frameworks for producing and distributing content. Wikipedia, I, Salil already uh, gave an excellent uh, description of the uh, dispute resolution uh, mechanisms. So we have informal mediation a mediation committee and then an arbitra arbitration committee. Now it is true that, that the people who sit on those committees are being elected in a way which is at least somehow democratic, but at the end of the day these are all top-down mechanisms that have no collaborative participatory re reflections in the way they uh, decide upon disputes. Moving toward the commercial edge, uh, commercial intermediaries which function as frameworks for uh, content sharing platforms for social networks, again, overall, if you look at YouTube and Flickr, there's no reference to dispute resolution. Moreover, throughout its proprietary control, YouTube has the sole expression to decide upon removal issues and other disputes between users. Same thing goes for Second Live and for Facebook. Linden Lab has the right but not the obligation to decide upon disputes between users if within the virtual community. Facebook, Facebook has the right. Facebook has the right but not the obligation to decide upon disputes between users as for materials on the platform. So, generally speaking, we can observe that there is a gap between the collaborative nature of platforms and the manner in which disputes are being resolved. Mostly disputes are being resolved in the usual traditional legal structure, either through the general judiciary system or throughout the imposition of proprietary contractual uh, restrictions, there's no strong sense of collaboration and participation in building up the rules for settling disputes and then in determining the norms uh, through which disputes will be uh, decided upon. And I think that two questions arise. The first question is why has such a structure evolved? The second question is, should it be changed? Why is such a structure evolved? I think there's no one straightforward answer that is un unilateral to all the examples that I gave. As for proprietary platforms such as YouTube and Facebook, it seems only natural that those commercial platforms want to preserve 
the control and avoid uh, any external interference. There are also many possible market failures that deal with users' lack of incentive to battle over ODR issues, especially when we speak about platforms that have a strong network effect with, the, with a lock-in element that prevents users from migrating to other platforms. Uh, it should be mentioned that Facebook has uh, several recent developments, for example, regarding its IP policy that exemplify the fact that at times users may have an impact on building up the internal legal norms of the community and maybe a long time these uh, impacts will also have some influence on the way disputes between users are being uh, handled. As for the Creative Commons license and the GPL license, I think that here it's quite harder to explain why those licenses have no reference to the issue of dispute resolution because I think the founders, those who established those licenses, should have been aware of the fact that courts will have limitations in taking into account and adopting the values, <coughs> the sharing norms that underlie those licenses. Regarding Wikipedia, I think the question is uh, much more complicated and to some degree it goes back to Salil's uh, lecture. I think it eventually, at the end of the day, uh, it is the question how do we decide upon the boundaries of truth. If Wikipedia un understanding of truth is as one objective truth, the traditional conception, conception of, for example, historical truthfulness, then maybe uh, top-down mechanisms are indeed the right way to determine disputes between users, yet if our, under, if our understanding of truth is much more relativist, much more minded of subjective elements, of collaborative mechanisms in structuring narrative as a, about truth, then maybe uh, participatory and collaborative elements should be taken into account when someone determines the boundaries of legitimacy within the community of Wikipedia. Looking ahead, I think that one observation that I came up with is that those who are involved in collaborative cultural production, those who are involved in setting the rules for collaborative cultural production, should pay more ex ante attention to the issue of dispute resolution. Now, before finalizing, I must emphasize that I'm perfectly aware of the fact that there are significant differences between the various examples that I just mentioned. I'm also not sure, I'm quite sure that there isn't any one type of unilateral mechanism for incorporating collaborative and participatory elements into dispute resolution. Uh, I can also speculate that the degree of those elements would vary from one type of platform to another. YouTube is still a commercial entity. To some degree, it will work differently than the Creative Commons license. Yet, one puzzle still remains. There is a strong gap between the collaborative nature of those platforms. At times, also, their tendency to collaborate in creating new substantial legal norms and, on the other extreme edge, the fact that at the end of the day, dispute resolutions are mostly left to the traditional legal system. Mm, thank you.
Okay. Uh, well, for the second time, I'm extremely pleased to be here. Uh, I thought I would uh, be able, uh, as the person going last, to say something uh, insightful about the various themes that were r raised earlier, uh, and I'm really at a loss. Uh, perhaps uh, Orna can make, uh, provide some a sense of uh, consistency here. Uh, but I think uh, one of the themes might be uh, the one I mentioned earlier, that uh, we don't really have to work very hard uh, to, cr to generate disputes. Uh, applications described as collaborative somehow end up uh, being full of disputes. And uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the, uh, the designer of the World Wide Web, uh, wrote in his book recently, my motivation was to make sure the web became what I'd originally intended it to be, a universal medium for sharing information. Well, I think he should have realized uh, that a lot more was going to happen than simply sharing information. And uh, the more creative we are in using information or uh, communicating information or, most importantly, processing information, uh, the more disputes we are going to have. And I think uh, if we're patient, uh, the more need uh, we will have for online dispute resolution. and and the more creativity we will find in, in responding to, dis in to, to disputes. Uh, the idea of wikis, well, wikis are, are a different form of using information. The, um, the, the new deputy chief, uh, uh, deputy director of the, uh, the White House Office of Technology, Science and Technology Policy, Beth Novak, uh, is the author of a book published uh, just a month ago called Wiki Government. Uh, she wrote that book before she was in the government and uh, will be interesting to find out uh, how, how her ideas play out. Uh, one of the things uh, that we know about the new Obama administration is that it believes technology is a solution uh, to many problems and uh, Mr. Obama is um, per, is definitely um, the president we have had who is most familiar with the uh, use of technology and clearly uh, a believer in technology. And I thought uh, this morning I would talk about one of these initiatives uh, that's a very high priority and that uh, raises all of these issues of um, how we use technology creatively uh, but how at the same time we pay more attention than perhaps some of these um, um, entities uh, that were just referred to, how we pay more attention in advance to, to contemplating the resolution of disputes and how disputes are, are likely to be generated. Uh, this is a, a particularly important uh, initiative because it's not a private initiative, it's a governmental initiative. Uh, it has to do with uh, the development of electronic medical records and the use of electronic medical records uh, in the United States. Uh, there are probably uh, many of you from different countries in which uh, patients have electronic medical records. Uh, in the U.S., it's, uh, it's uh, somewhat rare. Uh, health, uh, health costs are extremely high. Uh, use, of tech, use of electronic records is extremely low, and the Obama administration is uh, planning to devote or allocate almost $20 billion uh, so that over the next three to four years, uh, the use of electronic medical records will, will increase. It sounds like a wonderful idea. Uh, it, it has the potential, it's being sold uh, as having the potential to improve health care. After all, uh, if, if I need to uh, see a physician here for some reason, uh, that physician here should somehow be able to have access to my uh, medical record located in the States. Um, $20 billion these days is also intended to put a lot of people to work, and there's a great need, uh, given the economy, to put people to work. 
so this is the thought. We will uh, we have the technology. We'll use the web. We'll create applications, and we'll, uh, it's done in other countries. And we will have improved health care, increased employment, and all kinds of other benefits. Uh, it's usually described simply as moving paper files to electronic form, and uh, most of the money is actually going to be uh, devoted to doctor's offices. Uh, doctor's offices are the, the weak link in the current scheme. So when individuals go to the doctor, uh, their files are in paper form. When the doctor gets reimbursed by the insurance company, uh, well, that's handled electronically. Um, ph pharmacies that are paid by insurance companies, well, that's handled electronically. And a fair number of hospitals uh, have invested in various forms of electronic records. Uh, very little of this is, is connected. Uh, but the weak link, it's currently thought, are the doctor's offices. Can I get my bottle of water? I could use a drink. That's fine. Uh, well, is this true? Um, so this idea that, uh, we're being sold that this is a movement from paper records to simply paper, simple paper records to electronic records, from paper to electronic form. Um, in, in the United States, most uh, individuals have never looked at their medical records. Uh, I'm curious about practices in other countries, but I confess to being unfamiliar with those practices. Uh, in the U.S., it's uh, rather peculiar, but when one visits a physician's office and one is waiting in the waiting room, it's almost, I think it's universally true that um, the manila folder, the paper file, is, is never, you're never left alone with it. Uh, you you can you could of course and you even have a legal right to uh, to look at it uh, but most of us never do so we don't know what's inside uh, we don't know if the information is accurate uh, or not and we don't really know how it's used uh, and in a sense we are don't really care that much because it's assumed to be the exclusive domain of the doctor. Uh, what happens when you move that that kind of document or file to electronic form? Well, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, the administration is assuming that you're just taking the data, you're scanning the data, and you're moving it uh, to electronic form, and basically uh, information is information. On the other hand, um, the new electronic records are actually nothing like the, the paper records. And uh, we run into problems over and over again when we, uh, our language is limited. And I think uh, record, these are not really, the, the paper files are, are something and the electronic files are something. Uh, but to use the word record suggests that they're the same thing and they're not the same thing at all. Um, the paper files are, are in these folders. The electronic files are actually composite files. so. You have the file information from the hospital. You have information from various doctors. It's all, it's all in, in one place. And if I have a few um, minutes uh, left to me, I'll, I'll show you an example of this. Um, and then the data starts moving around. Uh, and the data moves to the insurance company. And data moves to pharmacies. And uh, patients want to hold this data. And patients have access to, d to this data. So uh, when I said before I've never seen my, my paper file, I have seen my electronic file. And I keep thinking, that's, well, that's odd, because I've had a paper file for, since I was born. And I never looked at it. And I've only had an electronic file for a couple of years. Uh, and I'm privileged to have an electronic file. Most, most uh, citizens don't. It happens to be a result of where I live. Uh, but I've looked at my electronic file much more than I've looked at my paper file. Uh, because it's accessible to me, and it tells me that uh, when everybody has electronic files, uh, their behavior is going to be different. And their concerns over the information in these things is going to be different. 
And uh, one of the things we're going to find is that um, we have problems with the information we find because we're going to see that uh, it's, not n it's not accurate and it may be used in ways that uh, are problematic for us. Uh, so let me um, give you a couple of uh, more concrete examples. Uh, one is a news story that was in the uh, Boston Globe um, my local newspaper a couple of weeks ago. Well, actually, uh, actually, it's this story. Uh, this gentleman, Dave de uh happens to work in the uh, technology industry, so he's uh, he has a, his own electronic file, and uh, the the hospital system he belongs to, which is the hospital system I belong to. Uh, decided that it would collaborate with, uh, collaborate again, maybe the wrong term, uh, that it would participate in a, a system with uh, Google Health and, and Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft and Google Health have their own uh, system of electronic medical records. It's free. Anybody can use it. Uh, their process is based, was based on the idea that individuals would provide the data. So their system originally was intended to be something like a paper file uh, in which I had, might have written down all my prescriptions, all my medications, you know, whatever else I might uh, need to tell a doctor uh, that I couldn't remember myself. Uh, it turned out this wasn't really one of Google's great ideas. Uh, because uh, people don't like to enter data or people have trouble entering data accurately. So uh, Google decided, well, it could get all the data that exists in other places. Uh, and the place, places they exist are hospitals and uh, those systems that have electronic medical records. So this individual, Mr. de um clicked on the box of uh, his medical record that said he could send his data to Google Health or they would send his his data to Google Health and then Google Health uh, would have also a composite information he provided information shipped over from the hospital system uh, and that would be a more more useful uh, record well what happened uh, probably can't see this uh, but he was told the following. Google told him that uh, Mr. de Bronckhart had, had already had kidney cancer. Google told him that his cancer had spread to either his brain or his spine, a frightening diagnosis that de Bronckhart had never gotten from his doctors and listed an array of other conditions that he never had as far as he knew, like chronic lung disease, aortic aneurysm, a warning announced his blood pressure medication required immediate attention. Um, well, it turned out like none of this was true. Uh, uh, it's a bit complicated, but what happened was that uh, the hospital sent over the data, the, the information that it had sent to the insurance company in order to get paid. And uh, these weren't diagnoses by doctors about his health. These were diagnoses used in order to get the physicians compensated. Uh, that's not really fraud, that's simply the way current practices are. Uh, might sound like fraud. <laughs> uh, the problem, the, the real reason it's not fraudulent is that uh, there are not enough codes. Uh, there are more procedures and processes, medical processes, than there are codes. Well, there happened to be about 10,000 codes. You would think that would cover it, uh, but it turns out it doesn't. <clears throat> and that contributes to another problem. Again, we're in the process of using new information in new ways. So these 10,000 codes, which don't cover all diagnoses and treatments, and therefore you find doctors find the closest one, <clears throat> The World Health Organization uh, and, and the U.S. government and other governments have already done this. But in the U.S. it will be adopted over the next four years, uh, I'm sorry, two years, uh, a new series of codes, 150,000 of them. 
So, uh, how can you have a system with 150,000 codes uh, in which you can have trust? I think that's another theme that's come up here. Trust in the accuracy of the information. Uh, if you don't have trust in the accuracy of the information, uh, what value is, is this information? Uh, so uh, I don't think anybody will have trust in their medical records unless there are systems for, for dispute resolution. So I, tell me when I'm running out of time, but I'd, I'd, like, to show you, uh, I'd like to show you my own record, uh, which is the same system Mr. de Brancart, uh uses. And uh, it's very simple. You sign in here, and you uh, end up here. And um, on the right side, you can see that Beth Israel Deaconess has partnered with Microsoft Health Vault. I could do that if I want to. I'm not sure I do. Uh, and if I want to look at my records, and the first time I did this, uh, the the only reason the only reason I'm I I uh, developed an interest in this is that I looked at my uh, looked at my own record, and I didn't really care for what I found. So we're live here. Um, So I'm fairly healthy. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't show this to you. <laughs> uh, and this is, uh, you know, in terms of the layout and the uh, the interface, it's it's uh, relatively primitive. Uh, but basically, this was um, this is a listing of my uh, visits over a ten-year period to the emergency room. Broke my rib, um, burned my hand went to Romania, why this is, these are all in the same place. Uh, got some shots when I went to Romania. Um, that, none of this bothered me, but then said in, in February 22nd, 99, I had an anxiety disorder. Uh, I might have had anxiety, I frequently have anxiety, but uh, anxiety disorder, no, I don't know what that was doing there. And it bothered me, and uh, it still bothers me. And if we're in the paper record again, uh, I would never know about it. Uh, but this bothers me uh, for all kinds of reasons, because this data is moving around. Uh, you know, I may not send it to Google Health, but they're sending it to, uh, to the insurance company. The insurance company is sending it to other people. There are categories of businesses. Uh, you create these electronic medical records. Well, what really is happening is you're creating a, a a valuable new information market, market of information about uh, about uh, treatments, and uh, sometimes it may not be identified. The patient may not be identified, but the data is out there, and uh, it's all being used uh, lawfully. Uh, so I decided, well, I'd like to get this um, removed. And uh, as you can see here, uh, there's no place to click to uh, ask to get anything removed. And it turns out in the United States, it's actually against the law to delete information from, uh, from a medical record. Uh, that has to do with preserving accurate records. Uh, it's, it's clearly a, a remnant of, of paper um, because you could do it other ways, and eventually they will do it other ways. Uh, so I uh, asked the the overseer of this. Good. בהקשר הזה לא דיברתי כאן, אבל אפשר למצוא למשל את אחיו שממשיך לכתוב, ומי שקורא אחיו נמצא בסעודיה, אולי דיבר על זה מוחמד, אולי לא, אחמד אל קוטוב, והוא כותב בדיוק, מוחמד אל קוטוב, סליחה, ממשיך לכתוב 